thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Find out more later on. Hey, 42 here. In 2002, 52 year old Karen Keegan lay in her hospital bed in Boston, Massachusetts, awaiting a kidney transplant. She was suffering from acute kidney failure, but the search for a compatible organ donor had been, so far, unsuccessful. Concerned for their ailing mother, her three adult sons underwent genetic testing to see whether any of them could spare a compatible kidney. But when the tests had been processed, the doctors were met with some surprising results. Two of Karen's sons weren't actually hers. Now, if Karen had been male, the implications of this test would have been obvious. Plenty of men have discovered later in life that they didn't really father their children. But Karen was not male, and that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. After all, she knew the boys were hers on account of, you know, having given birth to them. The genetic tests revealed that she was, thankfully, related to her sons. She was their biological aunt. And yet, Karen had no sisters. So what the hell was going on? Now, if you love traveling, then you'll love the fastest and easiest VPN, Surfshark. Did you know, Surfshark also helps you to avoid price discrimination based on your location. So you can actually save money on plane tickets and car rentals whilst traveling. Surfshark runs on any device anywhere, and it's packed full of features, such as industry-leading uncrackable encryption, IP and DNS leak protection, an internet kill switch if your VPN drops out, and 24-7 customer support. By using Surfshark VPN, you can stay anonymous and secure online. But personally, I use Surfshark to watch Netflix content from other countries, such as the US. That's usually blocked here in the UK. It's really easy, all you have to do is switch over your location settings, and there you have it. You've got access to all your favorite programs. Surfshark maintains a strict no logs policy, and their network of 3,200 servers in over 65 countries runs completely on RAM. So they couldn't log your data even if they wanted to. By using the code 42, you will benefit from an 83% discount, plus four extra months for free during the holiday period, the 1st of November to the 31st of December. All you have to do is click the special link in the description below. Don't miss out. A few months later, Lydia Fairchild received a similar test result, claiming that she was not the biological mother of her two children. She was accused of fraud and nearly lost custody. But luckily for Lydia, her attorney stumbled across the story of Karen Keegan in the nick of time. You see, both Karen and Lydia had something in common. They both had a secret twin. And I don't mean a long-lost twin like Luke Skywalker in Princess Leia. I mean a secret twin that was hidden inside of them. Confused? They were too. But as it turns out, not only were their bodies made up of their own cells containing their own DNA, they also played host to the cells of their unborn twin sisters, which contained a second, totally unique genetic code. Some of the egg-producing cells in their ovaries must have contained this second genome from their lost twins, meaning that both Lydia and Karen had given birth to the children of women who had never been born. This incredibly weird phenomenon is known as biological chimerism. It's named after the chimera, a fire-breathing beast from Greek mythology, with the body and head of a lion, a protruding goat's head on its back, and a serpent at the end of its tail. Human chimeras are a little less dramatic than that, but they do have some distinguishable features. Some have two-toned skin or different colored eyes, two different blood types, or if the twin cells are of a different sex, both male and female genitals. But most human chimeras don't show any noticeable signs of the condition at all. Karen's chimerism hadn't even showed up in her blood tests because her blood cells were all produced from a single cell line, her own. 
So why does this biological chimerism occur? Well, early in a twin pregnancy, the embryos are in close enough contact that one twin can absorb the cells of the other. In the case of human chimeras, one twin fully absorbs the cells of the other, fusing their embryos together to produce one individual with two different genomes, just like Karen and Lydia. Embryonic cell absorption isn't the only way biological chimeras can form either. In fact, if you've ever had an organ transplant or a blood transfusion, you too will be carrying around another human's DNA inside your body. This can be quite problematic in forensics because there's a small chance that an individual's genetic fingerprint might not actually be theirs. For example, in 2004, DNA collected from a sexual assault case was matched to that of a man who had been behind bars at the time of the attack. A rerun of the blood tests confirmed it was definitely his DNA, but how could he have committed the crime from his high security cell? Harry Potter style time turners aside, one person just can't be in two places at once. Or can they? Well, no. Not without amputations. But your DNA can be. You see, a few years earlier, this man had received a bone marrow transplant from his brother. Bone marrow is the soft tissue that fills the cavity in the centre of our bones, and it's responsible for maintaining a constant supply of healthy blood cells to the body, including more than 220 billion new red blood cells every single day. As a result, the man's blood contained his brother's DNA as well as his own, and it was his brother's DNA, not his, that had been found at the scene of the crime. But you don't need something as dramatic as an organ transplant to end up with other people's DNA in your cells. During pregnancy, cells are transferred between mother and fetus across the placenta. As a result, both mother and baby become microchimeras, meaning they each carry a small number of cells with a different genome to their own. The fetus's cells circulate through the mother's body and can end up lodging themselves in various organs. In most cases, these cells are removed by the mother's immune system after the baby's born, but some fetal cells stick around for years. In fact, in one study, nearly two-thirds of women had traces of their son's fetal DNA in multiple regions of their brains decades after they'd given birth. These same cells can also end up being transferred to any future fetuses. So, if you have older brothers or sisters, you may well have some of their DNA floating around inside of you. Probably not enough to frame them for murder before you start getting any ideas. The thing about these fetal cells is that, unlike most adult cells, their fates haven't yet been sealed. Under the right condition, these so-called stem cells can differentiate into almost any cell type, be that a brain cell, a heart cell, a blood cell. You get the idea. Once they become lodged in a specific tissue, they use chemical cues from their neighbouring cells to figure out where they are, so that they can develop into the right cell type for that specific tissue. Basically, they take trying hard to fit in to a whole new level. In some cases, these fetal stem cells can actually be beneficial to the mother's health. They've been found in the healed scars of C-sections, which suggests they may play some role in wound healing in the mother's body. And in one extreme example, a woman's failing liver suddenly began to regenerate itself thanks to the lingering stem cells of a child she'd given birth to nearly 20 years before. Unfortunately, these fetal stem cells are a bit of a mixed blessing, much like most children, and have been associated with increased rates of autoimmune disease and cancer. Okay, but what if you have no secret twin, no organ transplants, and you've never been pregnant? Surely then all the cells in your body are just yours, right? Actually, no. As weird as this may sound, most of the cells in your body aren't yours. In fact, only about 43% are even human. 
The other 57% of your cells are the microbes, including bacteria and fungi, that collectively make up your microbiome. Think about that for a second. You are literally a walking pile of fungus. You're welcome. But before you go and ask your GP for a year's supply of his finest antibiotics, it's worth remembering that without this army of microscopic interlopers, you literally wouldn't survive. And whilst they may outnumber you, at least these little critters that have made you their big squishy home aren't that much of a burden. They only make up around 1-3% to of your total body weight, despite being found pretty much everywhere. On your skin, in your mouth, in your lungs and eyes. Of course, the mother load of microbes are found in our guts. Your gut microbes help you break down food and provide essential nutrients that your own cells just can't produce by themselves. They help to stimulate your immune system when your body is under threat and they can protect you against infections. The presence or absence of certain microbes in our guts has also been linked to countless diseases, including diabetes, autism, Parkinson's disease and obesity. But perhaps one of the most surprising things about our belly-biting bacteria is their influence in our brain and our mood. For example, mice that have been fed gut bacteria from people suffering with depression begin to show signs of depression themselves. That's because gut bacteria produce various neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine that play an important role in regulating our mood. And there's evidence that these microbes can alter our behavior as well. People with more diverse microbiomes tend to have larger social networks, and shy mice begin to act more confident when they're given the gut microbes of their more adventurous counterparts. It works the other way around too. Lower microbiome diversity is associated with anxiety and stress. Being a researcher in this field isn't exactly the most pleasant of jobs, by the way. After all, when it comes down to it, it's basically just shifting through shit. But all that toshing has at least borne some fruit. Fecal transplants are already being used in some hospitals to repopulate the depleted microbiomes of patients with serious abdominal ailments. Seriously though, don't try this one at home. The human genome is made up of about 20,000 genes. But if you add up all the genes in your microbiome, the figure comes out to somewhere between 2 and 20 million. Your microbiome is also totally unique to you, and even identical twins share only about 30% of their gut microbes. Most of us are first exposed to these microbes when we pass through our mother's birth canal, but one in five babies are delivered by C-section, which means that many children miss out on this important bacterial baptism. But don't worry if you don't happen to have arrived in this world by being squeezed out of your mother's vagina. That doesn't mean you'll be cursed with unhealthy gut microbes for the rest of your life. Our environments and our diets also play a huge role in determining our gut microbes, as does our DNA. We used to think of ourselves as being half mum, half dad, and 100% us. But clearly, that's not the case. Our brains and bodies are constantly being influenced by the thousands of other genomes that exist inside of us, and our intimate relationships with these different cells are what makes us who we are. You aren't a single entity, but a complex ecosystem. One that becomes a little bit more human, statistically speaking, every time you take a dump. Although perhaps it's time to redefine what it means to be human in the first place. Thanks for watching. Good news, you can now pre-order my new book, Bread and Circuses, What Did the Romans Ever Do For Us? It's a wild and witty journey for a thousand years of unexpected Roman history. Told in a refreshing way, and packed full of incredible and unbelievable stories. Copies are selling out fast, so pre-order yours today to lock it in. Thank you.